Hi, I'm Ben Abate, and I'm a student in the Executive Masters in Management program at the London School of Economics. Today I'm going to do a short webinar on corporate decision making and cognitive biases that I call how to make really bad decisions. In today's webinar, we're going to introduce heuristics and examine how and why we use them. We're then going to look at three common cognitive biases and look at how they affect our ability to make good decisions. And then lastly, we're going to look at a simple decision, seemingly simple, that went very wrong, and analyze how game theory can predict uh, better outcomes. So who am I? So I'm in the 2015 class at the LSE in the Exec Masters in Management program. I'm a dual citizen of the US and the UK. And for the last 10 years, I've been in global client director roles and based around the world. So I spend a lot of time looking at other people's decisions and making decisions of my own in my corporation. Um, one of the things I'm doing as well is I'm writing a dissertation on social capital and alternate currency. So I'm very interested in heuristics, cognitive bias, and why people don't make better decisions in large organizations. So before we get started today, one of the things that I want to show you is a common scenario and something that I find very, very often, which is a very typical example of a dysfunctional corporate boardroom. Dilbert is a great uh, master of this, um, and they, you often come away with these things thinking about, yeah, I, I feel this. This is something that happens in my day-to-day -day life, but I'm not really sure what's going on. So at the end of this webinar, what I want you to be able to do is I want you to really be able to use heuristics, cognitive biases, and game theory as a simple frame to start to to improve your decisions. So if we look at this cartoon and think about what's really going on here, after you've gone through Kahneman and some of the other things I'm going to introduce, you should be able to do something like this, which is to understand and perceive all of the various things that are going on around us in those rooms. We've probably been in these positions either we've been Dilbert giving the data, we've been the guy objecting to the data, we know we're in very artificial and irrational activities, but we're not really sure how to get out of them. Now this is what you're going to learn today. So. What's really behind all of this? It's something that Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize twice, by the way, for looking at heuristics and cognitive bias, says thinking is hard, which is why we avoid it when it's possible. And now we're not saying that people are lazy. What we're saying is we're incredibly busy. So what we do is simplify our decision making by using shortcuts. And keep in mind, these shortcuts usually work, and that's why we use them. And that's going to be a common theme throughout this webinar. These things work. It's only when they fail us that they fail us spectacularly wrong. So let's think about some of the routines, shortcuts, and rules of thumb that we use in our everyday practice. One of the common ones that I like to use as a, as a patent. Um, in the US, you get 20 years of basically an intellectual property break from anybody else messing around with your patent. Now, that works most of the time. It tends to protect individuals and their property. They can develop really interesting and innovative ideas. But if we wanted to be really slick about it, we'd probably think of these kinds of ideas on an individual basis. So one of the things I like to think about around in intellectual property restrictions is that should we really be keeping Beatles covers under lock and cover? That was recorded a long time ago, probably not. But again, we impose these kinds of artificial things. So that's sort of an introduction and, 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 and view of how heuristics kind of work. So stay with me on this as you understand the frame. And this is what Kahneman really, really studied. He took it further, and this is where it gets really interesting. So I'm going to flip to the next slide. And we're going to talk about when things get bad, they get a lot worse. And when things get good, they tend to flatten out, which isn't exactly what we'd expect, is it? So let's go through this um, and try to unpick it a bit. Kahneman started to ask people the same question um, in two different frames. And what he did was, in laboratory experiments, he tried to start to see if people would have different answers to the same question. The classic question is asking, would you eat something that was 80% fat free? Or would you eat, uh, sorry, would you eat something that was 80% fat content? Or would you eat something that was 20% fat free? Not surprisingly, as you're probably already thinking, the major vast majority of people said yes to the 20% and no to the 80%. And that's very irrational, and we understand that doesn't make any sense, but this is something that's proven in laboratories and is gonna create a framework by which we're starting to understand why things like Dilbert exist, right? Because people make a lot of really bad and silly, uh, illogical decisions when they're surrounded by lots and lots of information. Um, now, let's take this a little bit further, and this is sort of my, my section on the right here, and this is exactly what, um, actually what Kahneman did. So, what happens when um, we start to ask those same questions over a long period of time? And this is when Kahneman 
um, repeated these experiments over weeks and weeks and weeks. And the best way to describe what he did is think about flipping a coin, right? And, and, and a gambling kind of frame is a really good way to think about this. If you start to flip coins over and over again and predict that you're either going to hit win, uh, heads or tails, um, he wanted to see if that developed a long-term bias. And could that bias be measured? And is that something that he could use to help describe why we sometimes make um, illogical decisions. So you won't be surprised to know that if people started racking up what they perceive to be wins, and what I'm saying here is say out of 10 times I said I was going to hit heads, I hit more than five. So I start to feel like I'm winning. Um, or on the other side, which is what we call the loss domain in the bottom left, the opposite started to happen, where they, their predictions kept coming in wrong. So he tests and tests and tests and tests this. And he starts to then add an additional question, which is once he's really getting people into um, trying to predict the outcome. And again, keep in mind, a coin toss is a great example because it's absolutely 50-50 chance that you're going to hit heads or tails. And he started asking people to keep predicting the outcome, keep predicting the outcome. And then he said, well, why don't you start to, um, start to put a little bit of money against this? So start to, start to add a little bit of money against this. And this is, the, this is this kind of gambling fallacy, right? So now look at the graph that I've showed you on the right-hand side and the gain and the loss domain. If I'm, if I, and we're first we're going to examine the, the red line. If I'm looking at um, flipping a coin and putting money against what my next coin toss will be, right? Logic dictates I ought to bet the same amount every single time, right? Because the probability of me flipping a coin and getting it right or wrong is the same whether I flip a coin once or whether I flip a coin thousands upon thousands of times. Interestingly, this isn't what people did, and this is a really important first of our cognitive biases. When they started to accurately predict the coin flip, uh, they started betting less and less money. So as they, you can imagine a guy in a casino, as he starts to collect his winnings, he starts to tail off in the way he's betting. And that's that, that black line that kind of curves and flattens out, whereas what you'd expect is it to go just up and down. The most important thing, and this is where we're going to talk about traders a little bit later in this webinar, is what happens when you perceive um, that you're losing and you start to lose. In fact, you don't just keep betting the same amount. You don't even slow down. What happens is you get a hell of a lot worse. So look at that tail and look at how severe that is. You know, you hear common um, phrases for this like chasing, uh, throwing good money after bad or um, chasing your losses or that kind of thing. This is proven in laboratories. It's a human instinct, right? And this is an incredibly dangerous thing in corporate environments. I see it all the time. There's not a sort of uh, meet boardroom meeting that I'm in that someone doesn't say, hey guys, we've spent $5 million on this project. We have to make it work. So consider what I've just said around Kahneman and um, that type of bias and reframe that question, right? So you're keeping Dilbert in your mind all the time. This is called prospect theory. Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for it, and at the very end, we're going to talk about um, how this kind of all links with some of the other common ones. Okay, so don't gamble, that's what I'm saying. Linda the Bank Teller is a really fun one, and this is my second cognitive bias. Now, I have to read this very specifically to you. Um, you can Google this, this is really common, it's all over the web, it's a really fun one, and you can play this trick on your friends. I'm going to read to you a description of Linda, and then I'm going to ask you a question, and you have to choose um, an answer. So let me read this now verbatim, okay. Linda is a 31-year-old, single, outspoken, and very bright woman. She majored in philosophy, and as a student was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, she also partnered in anti-nuclear demonstrations, right? Okay, so we've described Linda. Now I'm going to ask you about a uh, question about Linda, and I want you to pick an option um, that seems more probable, right? Two, two examples. So example A, is Linda a bank teller? Or option B, I'm going to ask you, uh, is Linda a bank teller and is she active in the feminist movement? So you've made your decision now and unfortunately I'm going to tell you that if you're like 85% of people that we survey when we do these, you're incredibly wrong. Um, Linda is not a bank teller and more active in the feminist movement. Why? That doesn't make sense to me. And we have debates in this in school and in class, and um, when I give you the answer, you're going to be kicking yourself. There's no possible way that B can be correct. It doesn't matter what the two conditions are. Because if you remember back to your eighth grade maths, B is a subset of A. So the chance of two things being more likely than one thing is never true. It can happen, and if you don't believe me, I want you to Google Linda the bank teller 
and have a look at the equation and then you'll be kicking yourself. So why am I bringing this up and, and uh, it's called conjunction fallacy. That's not incredibly an, an interesting point, but this is, again, this is uh, I think probably tied with first place for prospect theory and something I see large corporations fall into the trap of a lot of times. So here's the scenario and here's where this happens. I'm in a sales cycle trying to put together a deal for an individual and we start to make assumptions about what that guy really wants from us. And one person will say across from the table, I think he wants 10 free blocks. And someone will say, I think he wants 10 free blocks and a trip to X. Someone says, I think he wants X, Y, and Z. And it goes and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Guess what? That's never going to be more likely than something more simple. This is an easy trap I see businesses fall into. And again, you can impress your friends, Google Linda the bank teller, and find out if you're like the 85% or not. We're gonna do one more, um, and then we're gonna do a short piece on game theory. My professor, Paul Wilmon, um, in the 1980s, did a fantastic uh, controlled experiment with a group of um, financial traders here in the city of London. Traders are really fun to experiment on because they're an extreme version and, and sort of representative of a lot of things we have in the mainstream, except they're an extreme version of it. And why are they an extreme version of it? Well, they have to believe a very strange thing. They have to believe in two simultaneous and disparate ideas. The first is they have to believe, like the screen we're showing here, that what they see and what's the information available to them, which is available to everybody else, contains all the information they need to make a trade. So they have a price of a commodity as shown here. Everything that they need to know about what to do next is contained in that price, okay? That's called um, uh, efficient markets theory. It's not really important, it's not what we're talking about, but they need to believe that, right? The second condition they need to believe is they also need to believe that despite the fact that they and everyone else who competes with them and who is about to execute a trade has access to the same information they can make a smarter and more informed decision without any other information. So you're probably thinking right now, this is a really interesting group of people to test um, control bias on, right? Control bias is something where the more we perceive we're in control of things, the worse off our decision making usually becomes. And that's kind of an intuitive, natural thing, and we know that. We probably see the kinds of examples in our, our home life, for instance. The tighter you try to control what your teenager is doing, the more likely they're going to rebel against you, right? That's an easy one. So what did Wilmon do with these traders? He came up with a very fun little experiment, and then he correlated the results of that experiment against how well the traders were doing in the business. And the results are, are really surprising, interesting, and worth um, talking in this bigger frame around cognitive bias. So uh, he pulled the traders aside and he said, look, I want you to spend a minute and a half on a simulation that we've designed for you. There are three keys that you can press. You see here there are uh, Z, X, and C. Um, the simulation will run. Your job is to get that line as high as it can possibly go. And the winner uh, is going to win a prize. So traders being very competitive took the, to this like ducks take to water. They went through the whole entire thing. And then he interviewed them as they finished and said, OK, based on the result, how much uh, do you think you impacted the outcome, right? So you're probably thinking by now, as we were when this was explained to us, that the keys do nothing. The simulation runs, the keyboard, the, the uh, sim is completely artificial. But what he was looking for is he was looking to take a sample set of people who really believed that the action they took, despite the fact that there was no logic associated with it, impacted the outcome. He then took that top group of people and he correlated against their earnings for the last five years. And guess what? It was correlated inversely. They were the worst performers on the, um, on the trading floor. So this is, and you can tell your uh, corporate folks the next time you're sitting around a board table like I do, that knowing what you can control and what you can't control in a business environment is the key between success and failure. It's proven in a laboratory, and you can take that and start to really, again, unpick some of the kind of silly decisions we often make. Okay, now, I have to thank my dissertation supervisor for this next clip, um, Om Nahasaram, who, uh, this, this is a, a fantastic short clip of a decision that went horribly wrong. Uh, we're gonna look at this first, and then we're gonna come back and analyze the reasons why. And we're gonna use game theory. This is serious, life-changing money. Your jackpot today is 100,000, 150,000. You have 
one final decision to make. An easy decision. We're now going to play split or stick. I know you're the last two people in the country I have to explain this to. But you have two final golden balls. You each have a golden ball with the word split written inside. You each have a golden ball with the word steel written inside. You will make a conscious choice of choosing the split or the steel ball. If you both choose the split ball, you split today's jackpot of £100,150 and you go home with £50,075. If one of you splits and one of you steals, whoever chooses the steel ball will go home with £100,150. And the person who chooses the split ball goes home with nothing. If you both choose the steel ball, you go home with nothing. Okay. Before I ask you to choose, I want you to look at your two golden balls and make sure you know which is the split ball and which is the steel ball. This is very important. Make sure you don't show each other. Before I ask you to choose, I think you have some talking to do to each other. Stephen, I just thought they were puppy dog tears and they were real oh. tears and you were genuinely going to split that one. I am going to split this. I, I just, 50,000, um, I'm just, um, it's unbelievable. I'm very, very happy to go with 50,000. You were genuinely going to split If I stole off you, every single person there would run over here and lynch me. There was no way I could, I mean, everyone who knew me would just be disgusted if I stole. When, when people watch this, they're, they're not going to believe it. Please. I can look you in the, sir, I can look you straight in the eye and tell you I, I'm going to split. I swear down to you, I, I'm going to split. Okay. This is serious money. It is. Sarah, Steve, choose either the split or the steel ball now. Hold it up. We're going on with 50 grand each. I promise you that. Split or steel? You never know what's coming in this game. Congratulations. Sarah, you have just won £100,000. Stephen, I'm so sorry. Commiserations, you've lost. Okay, so, an unfamiliar feeling for one of you, but a horribly familiar feeling for the other. This has been Golden Balls. Until next time, goodbye. Golden Balls taught me that some people look for revenge quite easily and greed obviously knows no bounds. When Sue revealed the split ball, I wasn't proud. I didn't feel happy about what I'd done, but having been stabbed in the back last time, I just couldn't put myself through it again. Okay. Stephen and Sarah, what happened? <laughs> we were showing this in class. This is a fantastic uh, example of a very common and kind of introductory view of game theory. It's called The Prisoner's Dilemma. It's dressed up all the time on television shows and it's really fantastic and very dramatic. Um, it actually is a, uh, a very simplistic game that forms the foundation of game theory. So. Before we talk about that, I think, you know, I would, I'd like to put you in the shoes of where we were in class when we saw this and, and some of the questions that, um, that uh, our professor Ohmd asked us. So what should these guys have done? Why did this happen? Why did it go so wrong? Was there a dominant strategy and does my strategy matter, right? And then I think that for the first 10 minutes, we had a discussion about, well, Sarah tricked Stephen and it was really unfair because the right thing to do with all this money was to, to share the money and that's... That's a crazy strategy, and how can you protect yourself from someone who's going to lie to you? Okay, put all of that aside, put the emotions, the fireworks, and the theatrics. There is a dominant strategy. You can unpick this using something called the prisoner's dilemma, and I will guarantee you that from now on, when you're faced with a choice like this, you can understand something called a Nash equilibrium, and it really isn't important to know um, some of the theory behind that, but 
um, you can understand when to play games and when your dominant strategy is going to hurt you. So what happens in the prisoner's dilemma and what is game theory all about? As you saw from the, um, from the previous clip, it is very, very easy to form um, lots of different theories about what you should and shouldn't have done in this scenario. But really what it comes down to is this. You either go home with all the money or you go home with none of the money. There is no viable scenario that you can affect your partner to share the money. So there is no strategy that states that you should ever be in a position where you, you should um, put that forward. And also, by the way, this is what's really interesting about the prisoner's dilemma. Knowing what the dominant strategy is, which is to steal, means two things. It means that your opponent's strategy isn't implicated by it. And it also means that, guess what? Neither of you go home with anything. This is not a good game to play. You see this in supermarkets with price wars. Price wars destroy value on both sides of the fence. Tesco chops its prices, Sainsbury's chops its prices. Guess what? They both end up at a low, net lower price and they've destroyed the value between there and there. The prisoner's dilemma is not a good position to get into um, in a negotiation strategy because the dominant strategy, and to use the golden balls example, is to steal. You'll both make that activity and you'll each go home with nothing. This is often used in politics, it's used in um, uh, war gaming, it's used in multi-scenario planning. Uh, I've seen it affected in my company because also in most cases there's not a single decision to be done but there's actually multiple levels. So if I do one thing and you defect, what does it predict that I do next? Um, and there are a series of inductions that you can use to manage game theory. But for now, keep in mind that where these dominant strategies exist, these are games you don't want to play. You will not win them. Okay. That's it for me. I think one of the things I've given this talk a few times is um, people tend to despair at this point and think, well, great. I appreciate that, Ben. You said that I'm irrational. You said that what I think isn't really true and I'm going to chase my losses and all these terrible things. So I don't want you guys to despair. I want you to think about the three theories that we discussed, prospect theory, conjunction fallacy, and control bias. And remember that when you're in these kinds of corporate activities, the more things, uh, the, the worse things get, the more you're going to want to throw down. And you need to physically resist that and you need to lift your teams up, especially happens in big capital project investments. Um, in terms of conjunction fallacy, when you start to assume that more specific things are going to be true, remember your eighth grade maths. That can never happen. Simpler explanations have a greater probability of being true. Um, and the third piece is remember those uh, poor traders who thought that they could manipulate the world around them. Um, the more you are unaware of things you can and can't control, uh, the less productive you're going to be in these types of decisions. And lastly, avoid those games you can't win, right? Where those dominant strategies in Nash equilibria exist, um, you want to actually pull back from those activities. Price wars are a great example and in other scenarios where um, you start to play brinksmanship with um, opponents or in, uh, during negotiations. I'd love to um, get in touch and answer any questions you might have. Um, I do quite a bit of social selling on LinkedIn. Um, I write a blog for the LSE and that's my LSE email there. So uh, hashtag included as well. So stay in touch with me, um, bring your cognitive biases uh, forward to the table and I look forward to discussing them. I'll leave you now with some further reading. Um, Kahneman, Kahneman and Tversky who uh, won the Nobel Prize together for looking at prospect theory, um, a piece on conjunction fallacy, uh, my professor's work on trading and illusions, um, a piece on game theory and practice from The Economist, um, which also looks at how the world of big data and digitalization um, is bringing game theory into corporate boardrooms all across the world. Um, and lastly, Dan Gilbert's short article called Buried by Decisions. So that's been Ben Abate for LSE at Your Desk, talking about really bad decision making. Go forth and make really good decisions. <laughs>